Major support for Louisiana Eats comes from Zatarain's Hot Sauce. Memorial Day cookout recipes available at Zatarain's.com. From our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans, this is Louisiana Eats. I'm Poppy Tooker. With all the hoopla surrounding this year's tricentennial celebration in New Orleans, it might surprise you to learn that if LaSalle, the great French explorer, had his way, we would have been having this party 30 years ago instead of today. You see, once LaSalle discovered the great Mississippi River, he carefully marked the spot, intending to return with the supplies and the people needed to establish a settlement. Unfortunately, he overstood the mark by almost 400 miles, and the entire exploration ended dismally just off the Texas coast in Matagorda Bay. On this week's show, we'll speak with Jim Bruseth and Tony Turner, the archaeologists who discovered the ship and raised it from a watery grave. Once we learn about that misadventure, a team from the historic New Orleans collection will fill us in on archaeological digs that helped reveal what life was like here in the early days of the city. And then we'll celebrate a very important piece of New Orleans culinary history. Arno's Restaurant, which is celebrating their centennial during the city's tricentennial. We're rising up from a watery grave to party like it's 1686 on this week's Louisiana Eats. Every archaeologist dreams of finding the proverbial needle in the haystack unearthing clay pots from a civilization that no longer exists, or King Tut's tomb filled with gold and artifacts preserved like a snapshot of long ago. Few actually get to live that reality. Jim Bruseth is one of those few. Although he had information pointing to the French explorer La Salle's sunken ship lying somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, it was still considered something of a long shot to actually find the shipwreck. Thanks to technology, and probably a little bit of luck, that's exactly what he did. Archaeologists have parted the sea with a coffer dam, made a dry hole in Matagorda Bay to recover a French exploration ship that has been stuck in the mud on the bottom for 310 years. In 1995, divers reached down into the mud off the coast of Texas and grasped the handles of a cannon. This proved to be just a hint of what lay on the bay's bottom below. There, in fact, was La Belle, La Salle's ship that for three centuries had lay hidden on the muddy bottom of Matagorda Bay. Jim and his co-author, Tony Turner, sat down with us to relive their exciting discovery. This is the most exciting thing to me because we're busy celebrating our tricentennial, but we would have celebrated it 30 years ago if only LaSalle had gotten it right. That's exactly right. LaSalle attempted the first effort to establish a colony at the mouth of the Mississippi River in, in 1684, and he missed it and landed in Texas thinking he was at the mouth of the Mississippi River, but he was actually 400 miles away. Oh, my goodness. What a happen chance and a terrible mistake. Well, LaSalle had uh, sailed down the Mississippi River. He was the first European to do so in uh, 1682, and he placed a marker at the mouth of the Mississippi so he knew he could find it when he came back. But he came back a different way because Louis XIV decided to come through the Spanish Sea, which is what the Gulf of Mexico was called at that time, and they weren't familiar with the territory, and they missed the mouth of the Mississippi by a long shot. And in 1682, when La Salle discovered the mouth of the Mississippi River, he claimed all the land it drained for France, about a third of the United States, and that later became the Louisiana Purchase. And his goal was to come back and to establish a colony a few years after that discovery at the mouth of the Mississippi River. So his effort was the first attempt to establish what later became the city of New Orleans. Tell us about the mislaid plans of La Salle. 
La Salle came with 300 colonists, and he had a number of what he called gentlemen. These were uh, richer uh, families, uh, mostly men, but a few families that came with him that, that were investors in his expedition. But he had a number of people with him who were, when he got over here, were he found to be largely what he called boys with no skills. And the reason for that is that people in France at the time that were doing well didn't want to come to the New World. They were they, they heard stories about the bad things that could happen to you in the New World, and they were fine in France. So La Salle had to employ men to go hire colonists, and they got paid by how many colonists they hired. And in the process of doing it, they got ill-fitted colonists and a number of boys that were hired to be colonists, but really were young boys that knew very little and how to survive in the wilderness of North America. Where were they collecting these potential colonists from exactly? It would be uh, La Rochelle, France, and Rochefort, France. And these are two seaport towns on the southwestern coast of France. And they were rounding up beggars from the church steps? Yeah, things were so tough (laughs) that they had to go get beggars off the church steps. And uh, one account says that some of the uh, colonists were tricked onto getting onto the ship, probably drugged in some way, woke up on, on one of the ships heading to the New World. Tell us the story of what happened to La Belle. Well, La Belle was one of four ships that came across the ocean with uh, La Salle and his 300 colonists. It was a small ship, about 54 feet long, about 17 feet wide. And uh, it was given to La Salle uh, by King Louis XIV, a shallow draft vessel to be used to explore once he got to the New World. And uh, he came across the uh, Atlantic Ocean landed in Texas around Matagorda Bay, about midway between Houston and Corpus Christi, thinking he was at the mouth of the Mississippi River. So mistaken was he, and so misunderstanding the internal geography of North America at the time. So LaSalle landed, and uh, one of his ships was wrecked off the coast trying to come into Matagorda Bay. Another ship, uh, Le Jolly, had orders to sail back to France after it offloaded supplies and colonists. And so pretty quickly, he was down to one vessel, La Belle, as his lifeline. And so in 1685, he loaded everything he had left in uh, to La Belle for a colony on the Mississippi River mouth, anchored it in Matagorda Bay. He decided he would go overland, find the Mississippi River, come back, get his ship, La Belle, sail it around, and establish his colony on the Mississippi. LaSalle had no idea the Mississippi River was 400 miles away. He told people on board La Belle, stay put, don't move, I'll be gone 10 days, and I'll come and get you. Well, the people on board the ship waiting, the 10 days turned into 20 days, and, and then a month, and they began to run low on water, and they sent some of their sailors ashore to get some water, and the sailors never came back. The Karankawa Indians were hostile to the French colonists and probably murdered them. So the, the people that La Salle's uh, on board the ship, the, the men that had gone ashore to get water, they were probably killed by the Karankawa Indians. They never came back. And the diary of the expedition tells us that people on board La Belle, first, uh, they had some pigs. And they couldn't f- give the pigs water. They were running out of water. So they killed the pigs and ate the pigs, probably had a nice meal from that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then uh, things got so desperate that people began to die of thirst on board La Belle. The captain of the ship, according to the diary, uh, he controlled everything, and so he took control of the brandy and the wine. And we're told that there wasn't a day that went by that the captain wasn't drunk. Mm. Things get so bad in, in early February 1686, the captain decides to violate LaSalle's order sail around to the other end of Matagorda Bay to get help where there's a temporary French colony there. And as he does that, a strong cold front comes through. They lose control of La Belle, and it wrecks on the south southern shore of Matagorda Bay. Now, how long at this point has LaSalle been gone? LaSalle was gone over two months trying to find his river, desperately searching, having no idea that the river was miles and miles away. And when he finally came back, he heard that his last ship, La Belle, was lost, and he realized his efforts to establish a colony were, were failing terribly. So La Salle decided he needed to get help at that point for his colony. He couldn't go down into Mexico because the Spanish occupied Mexico, and, and he would be captured as a, as a traitor, as, a, as a, somebody, an enemy that should not be there. So in, in 1687, it took him a period of time to figure out what to do. He decided he would get help, and he would walk to Canada 
Oh, a little walk to Canada. That's If you were French in, in this part of the New World in the late 17th century, the only other French people were up in Canada, and that's what you had to do. So we took off with 17 men uh, headed towards Canada, and on the way in East Texas, an argument broke out about who was getting how much food. Some of LaSalle's men felt like they weren't getting their share of the food, and so they hatched a plot to kill LaSalle, and they ambushed him and shot him in the head and threw his body in, in, in the woods, stole his clothing, and that ended the, the great explorer LaSalle's effort to establish a colony in the New World. So LaBelle is on the floor of Matagorda Bay. It's just lying there for all those years. How long did the hunt for the ship go on? Well, I, I worked for the Texas Historical Commission, uh, an arm of uh, Texas government, and in the late 1970s, actually before I started working there, efforts were made to try and find that, that ship. We're, we're so lucky that when Spain heard about this French attempt to establish a colony in their part of the New World, they had a manhunt looking for La Salle. They had 11 expeditions by land and by sea trying to find the French colony. Uh, they eventually succeeded finding his temporary colony on Matagorda Bay, but after the Caranco Indians had killed everybody. But they also found in Matagorda Bay the remains of La Belle sticking out of the water, and they made a map. And on that map, they show Matagorda Bay, and then they show La Belle, its location, and they label it Navio Quebrado, Broken Ship. But they don't disturb it? They, they try to get what they can, but the majority of the ship is below water, ah. including the cargo. So they, they can only take some deck cannons, but nothing more, or very little more. And so uh, on the basis of that map, when I was working at the Texas Historical Commission, we said, we need to go out and find that ship. We have a pretty good idea where it is. And we did that in, in, in 1978. Uh, people before me, they didn't find it. And we did that again. We started again to look for it in 1995, and we found it. Oh, my goodness. What was that day like? Oh, it was absolutely amazing. We um, had done a, what's called a magnetometer survey where you drag a, like a super-sensitive metal detector behind your boat in a zigzag fashion to find iron. Every shipwreck has iron on it. And then on the basis of that, we looked at the targets, we prioritized them. And on the first dive, checking one of the targets, the divers went down and, and they could feel into the mud. Everything above the water or the mud line in the water had deteriorated, but they could feel down in there and they could feel the lifting handles of a cannon. <gasps> and a cannon means you got an old shipwreck. And so we were so excited. And it took us a few days to uh, free the cannon up. It was what we call concreted to the wreck, and we brought it up. It, it, it had French writing on it. Oh, my goodness. It had the insignia of Le Comte de Vermandois, and we did some more research on him, and he was Admiral of France from 1669 to 1683, and La Salle sailed in 1684. That was the confirmation that we had, in fact, found La Belle. After 300 years underwater, the 17th century ship was finally found. What came next was a decades-long process of excavating, recovering, and conserving La Belle's hull, along with over a million artifacts. We'll learn all about it when Louisiana Eats returns after a break. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Rouse's Markets, from Camellia Brand, Beans Done Right, a New Orleans tradition since 1923, and from the Napoleon House, located in the historic French Quarter, home of the Pimm's Cup Cocktail and the Toasted Mufalada. Lunch dinner, and private events at 500 Charter Street. Are you podcasting Louisiana Eats yet? If not, 
it's time to subscribe. Our exclusive podcast series, Louisiana Eats Quick Bites, is made up of sneak previews of material that hasn't hit the airwaves yet, along with full-length interviews never heard on the show before. Don't miss a minute of our delicious programming. So subscribe today on our podcast page at poppytooker.com. That way, you won't miss a single serving of our broadcast or our Louisiana Eats podcast. And now, back to Louisiana Eats. We've been talking with Dr. Jim Bruseth and Tony Turner about the 17th century French explorer Robert de La Salle and his failed attempt to establish what's now New Orleans. If he'd succeeded, the city's tricentennial would have been celebrated 30 years ago instead of today. When we left off, Dr. Bruseth was telling us about the 1995 discovery of LaSalle's ship, the LaBelle, 300 years after it was shipwrecked. This major find off the coast of Texas was only the beginning of the recovery and preservation process. What's the next part of recovery? So you know you've got it, but you don't know what's down there. So what happens next? Well, in a, in a shipwreck excavation like that, you really don't know. We brought up this beautiful bronze cannon that also had the royal crest of King Louis the Fourteenth on it. And uh, we, we knew that it was a miracle that La Belle was still there. Uh, probably a 1,000 miles from the Intercoastal Waterway Canal, where dredging's been taking place for years, 50 years probably. Yeah. And then oil exploration had occurred throughout Matagorda Bay, and they had missed La Belle. So we knew the, the miracle of its preservation wasn't going to last forever, and so we needed to excavate it. But the problem was it was in shallow water but zero visibility. So when you dive in, in Matagorda Bay, you see nothing. Everything's by feel. And we knew to recover a wreck that could be this historically important, it would be very difficult to do with what we call a dark water excavation. So we thought about it quite a bit and decided we would do something that had never been done in this hemisphere before. We'd build what's called a steel coffer dam around it, a steel structure around it, and pump the water out. And when we decided to do that, then we realized, oh, boy, we need a buckload of money because it's going to be very, very expensive. Yes, indeed. So we had to approach our Texas state government. And we were successful in getting $1.7 million reallocated from the Department of Criminal Justice to the Texas Historical Commission, my agency, and then private funders stepped in and and gave us money. And so about a year after its discovery, actually in September of, of 1996, we started the excavation. Oh, gosh, and how long did that take? And that took about seven months. And in that seven months, we found the bottom third of LaBelle, still preserved with the cargo loaded in in barrels and boxes as LaSalle had loaded it. Uh, and we're so lucky that uh, the LaBelle wrecked in a first storm. A second storm came and drove the hull down into the mud. The mud sealed the bottom third of the cargo and created an anaerobic environment. So in that bottom third of the hull, we found 1.8 million artifacts that represent basically what an explorer to the New World needed to build a colony in the New World. The only place in the world those objects have been found, including a number of um, cooking pots and food remains for what the colonists were going to eat and prepare in the New World. There was lots of evidence of culinary preparation that was all ready to go. From that journal of the expedition, we know that they really valued uh, turtle. They'd make turtle soup. Uh, some of the turtles would have eggs in them. They'd use the eggs to make a sauce. They talked about how good the sauce was. Uh, they also, uh, where they were living on the coast of Texas, they were huge bison herds that would come in there. And uh, for a while, it took them, di- they had difficulty trying to figure out how to kill the bison. Fortunately, LaSalle had with them a Shawnee Indian that he had, he had been given by a group up in the, the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes area as, as a slave. And LaSalle, his name was Nika, and LaSalle had uh, befriended Nika, and they became great friends. And Nika knew how to kill a buffalo. And so with Nika's help, they were able to kill the buffalo and butcher them. And, And they said that the buffalo became their daily bread. 
they would eat the buffalo meat, they could cure the buffalo meat, and, and they said it was good as any of the meat, maybe better than the cows they had back in France. And, Tony, I understand that you still would really like a brass colander to come home with you. The one we have in the exhibit at the museum is absolutely gorgeous, and it was this in the center of a nested collection of kettles, which are so gorgeous. They're brass. They could they were polished up, and they, they look like gold, gleaming in that case. And I would love to have those utensils in my kitchen today. <laughs> there was also a candelabra. There was a beautiful brass ladle. Um, pewter dishes and pewter chargers uh, inscribed with LG, which is probably the property of Sieur Le Gros, who um, was bitten by a rattlesnake and died. But these were elegant, elegant pieces of cookware, dinnerware, and we had forks and knives and all sorts of beautiful things. And as Jim said earlier, they were going to carry the traditions of France with them into the New World, and a lot of those survived. And they're beautiful. <laughs> it's fascinating to me. They prefer to pack things in barrels. Barrels were really the uh, container of choice on a ship. You, you could roll the barrel to get it to the, the ship, and you could pack it down there. And then you could actually pack them in different ways where they would interlock. So when the ship was at sea and the sea was rough, the cargo didn't start rolling around down in the bottom hold of the ship. So I would say probably the containers we found... Uh, 90% were barrels of different sizes, and then the other 10% were boxes. And I imagine that they held up fairly well. And Oh, when we were uh, excavating in that bottom third of the ship, the barrels were completely intact. And so my, my job directing that excavation was to oversee what we would excavate each day. It was absolutely amazing. We would, we would find a barrel, and we would take it out, and we'd open it up, and every day we'd see something brand new to us for what LaSalle thought he needed for his colony. I remember one day I opened up a, a barrel, and it was filled with axe heads, uh, probably 300 axe heads in there, all packed in tightly. Didn't find the axe handles. He could make that the New World, but he couldn't make the axe heads. We brought lots and lots of axe heads with him to be able to use to cut down trees and to build his New World colony. So you, you actually found some human remains. We did. And, and oftentimes, since I'm at the museum almost weekly uh, talking to the public about it, um, they always say, well, what was the most interesting thing that you found on the ship? And when you find artifacts that were left by people, that's very interesting because they held them, they made them, they used them. But when you find a person, it's a whole different thing. And when we found that skeleton of that poor man who probably died of thirst in the bow of the ship, lying on a bed of rope that would probably was his habitation site on the ship. It, it really took our breath away. And two-thirds of his brain was still intact. I mean, we had so much of that man and so much evidence of his life and the end of his life and what it was like. It, it was a very moving experience for us. Tell us about him. He was, um, we think we know his name, interestingly enough. There was a pewter porringer next to him that had the initial C and the last name Berange. So we think that's his name. Um, he was about five foot four. He'd had a very rough life. He had a very bad back injury, probably walked with a painful limp, had terrible dentition, as most people in that era did. He'd lost a lot of his teeth. He'd been in a fight. He'd had a broken uh, jawbone, broken nose, and blunt trauma to his head. But they'd all healed over. This was not related to the trauma of the ship sinking. So we tried to find his relatives in France to see if anybody had that name. We also tried to do um, DNA analysis on him. But the DNA analysis revealed there was a lot of marine organisms in the body as well. And so we couldn't get a complete sequence the first time we tried it. But 20 years later, we we're having more success with that. So we're redoing the DNA analysis, and, we're, and we've been able to sequence his DNA. And so we're in the process of continuing that and... Uh, I think in the next year or two, we'll be looking for his uh, relatives that hopefully live today in France and can link them back up to his story and his remains. How incredibly exciting. What happens to the man? Has he remained in some sort of a research capacity, or has he been interred in some way? We offered to send Monsieur Berange back to France. We talked to the French authorities, who were so wonderful to work with. It was a great international team effort. And we said, we'll send him home. And they said, you know, he wanted to come to the New World. He wanted to be part of this expedition, and we think he should stay there. 
So we have at, in Austin the Texas State Cemetery for dignitaries, officials, state officials, and so forth. And he's buried there That's so in charming. a beautiful tomb. And the French ambassador came with a team from France. We gave him a beautiful f- funeral with period music. And he's got this wonderful monolith with half of it written in English, half of it written in French. And he's resting there in Texas with us. And we're happy to have him there. For people who are interested in learning more about the story or even making the trip over to see LaBelle, how do we find it? LaBelle is currently displayed at the Bullock Texas State History Museum in Austin, Texas. There's a beautiful exhibit there in the main atrium. And later this year, we're going to be building out an even better, beautiful final exhibit for LaBelle. So everybody's invited to come to Austin, visit our State History Museum, see the remains of the ship and the artifacts, learn more about all aspects of the uh, excavation and the recovery. And then also in southern Texas, there are six museums that display different parts of the LaBelle exhibit or or LaBelle artifacts from the excavation, and that's called the LaSalle Odyssey. So you can travel to South Texas and learn even more about LaSalle's effort to establish a colony in Texas. And may I also say, if you'd like to see what LaBelle looked like, there's a beautiful painting in the Historical New Orleans Collection exhibit uh, by Théodore Goudin. It shows the flagship, the warship, Le Jolie. It shows the Amable wrecked, which was the supply ship. And on the left-hand side is this beautiful little small frigate, LaBelle. So if you want to see her picture, Historic New Orleans Collection has it. That's incredible. Thanks so much for telling us all that wonderful history. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Bruseth and Tony Turner, co-authors of From a Watery Grave, The Discovery and Excavation of LaSalle's Shipwreck, La Belle. Crescent City, the historic New Orleans collection has their own team of archaeologists uncovering artifacts that speak volumes about the city's origins. The only difference is, instead of looking underwater, they are looking below the city streets. We invited part of the HNOC's team to our studio, and archaeologist Elizabeth Williams began by explaining how they unearth artifacts for the museum's collection. The Historic New Orleans Collection had um, purchased a portion of what what used to be the WDSU TV station in the French Quarter, and they um, elected to have archaeology done at the site. We also did monitoring on the site as well to see if there were any deposits of importance that we could save them if necessary. And one of the portions of the property under construction was an area that we saw to be um, to have a deposit from the French colonial era. And it was very early. I mean, it seemed so to be. It was almost seven feet deep. Um, And so we got them to halt construction for a little bit for us to go in and salvage some of that material. So what did you find under there? What was there? Um, Well, we were lucky. We definitely found um, old bottles, old wine bottles that we assumed to be from French origin. We also found pottery on the site that we know was produced in France. It was called tin enamel earthenware. Um, and we also call it French faience. And so we found we found that. And so we knew we that signaled to us that this could be an early colonial deposit. We also found lots of botanical seeds on site as well that we couldn't identify, you know, on the ground, but we still took them back to our laboratory and sent them to a specialist to process. And what were those seeds? Well, um, we found watermelon seeds, um, persimmon seeds, plum pits. We also found seeds that could be from either raspberry or blackberry. And Ryan, what does this tell you about the people who were inhabiting that site? You know, it's something that we're really only getting a a good sample of now. Although there's been archaeology going on in the city of New Orleans for 50 years on and off, uh, for a while, much of it was focused on the prehistory of the city, on prehistoric sites out in New Orleans East, 
uh, then it would just be often a matter of, of luck that, that, that it happened. Now, because of local institutions uh, and, and, and organizations and, and private individuals giving us access to a more consistent selection of properties, we're getting a much more complete picture of, of early New Orleans uh, through its material remains. So this is now at least the fourth site that I'm aware of that the Historic New Orleans Collection has uh, allowed archaeological work to take place. What are the things that you learned about the way they lived at that time? To me, some of the most important things that this other work, that this body of work as a whole is telling us about, though, is just the role of um, indigenous peoples and of captive Africans and all these people coming together in the colonial era of the city. We have so much material culture that connects to uh, indigenous peoples and to indigenous foodways, native foodways, and how those are influencing the French colonists, that we can start putting together a much richer picture of what daily life was like in the, in the colonial city. I'd love to know if there was ever one day that, you know, you're, you're on a dig and you find something and you just go, oh. Well, within that site, we did find this <laughs> wine bottle, right? And it was full of 300 lead BBs. And really? Yes. And so it was just one of those moments where, and it was, it was funny because, you know, we clean out the bottles that we do find with steel BBs because it's a nice cleaning agent. It's an adjutant. And so then we dump out all of the BBs and, you know, that's it. And so this time it was one of those situations where instead, of, like, I didn't put the steel BBs in yet, but yet I was shaking a container with BBs in it. And then I dumped it out and it was lead BBs from the historical period. So it was, I, I just thought it tickled me so much. I thought it was so fun. Um, and and also just to think that someone might have repurposed this wine bottle to put lead BBs in. I mean, you just get into someone's mindset a little bit. And I, I just enjoyed that. I thought that was fun. So now that we're getting this much larger collection of material that we can securely date to the French colonial era in particular, and then to you know, a separate layer from the Spanish colonial era into, you know, different subsets of those. It's allowing us to start thinking about human impacts on the environment by looking at the the objects left behind. So we're starting to notice that, you know, we have lots of different kinds of, of fish bone. I've been working with um, a zooarchaeologist, someone who specializes in the study of animal bone, and we're putting together this project to use the bone from all these different fish that we're finding, compare those to contemporary populations, come up with ways of estimating size, and use that as a way to think about the effect of human exploitation on you know, coastal environments over time. What are some of the things that you learn from finding these foodstuffs on the site? Well, uh, we can surmise about some of how it could have been prepared by um, not only looking at the artifacts and then also reading into some of the accounts, the earlier travelers' accounts from the first colonists over into this area. Um, so one one food type that we believe was made based on these accounts was persimmon bread. And so it would have been bread that was baked with some of the persimmon fruits. And again, we found some of the pits at the historic New Orleans collection site. So um, that could be one way that some of that was used. Another was um, preserves, possibly from some of the blackberry or raspberry seeds that we found on the site. Um, and then there were some discussion, brief discussions of some medicinal usage um, for some of the passion flower or some of the raspberry and blackberry seeds, but um, not so sure how to be sure to say that that is what it was used for. And, and the one thing that, that I might add to this is that often what we use to think about foodways in, in general, and, and archaeologists do think about foodways sort of more broadly than, than, than just food, because we think about how food was, uh, was presented, how it was prepared, how it was stored, all of these interrelated things that we're observing often indirectly, and that's why archaeologists love ceramics, love pottery so much, because ceramic tablewares tell us about the rituals of dining, about, you know, about class and status, the sorts of things that we find can tell us a little bit about how foods were stored and preserved. And these things give us this indirect clue to the importance of food uh, more broadly considered. Archaeologists Elizabeth Williams and Ryan Gray, a few of the minds behind the HNOC's collection. What 
is that prickly pear that proved to be the demise of so many of LaSalle's shipmates? And is it still eaten today? Stay tuned, and we'll answer that question when we come right back. Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarans, and from French Market Coffee. French Market Coffee's premium blended beans are locally roasted in small batches, creating a coffee that can only be called New Orleans Bold. This week's culinary quiz question brought to you with support from Popeye's Louisiana Culinary Institute. What is that prickly pear that proved to be the demise of so many of LaSalle's shipmates? And is it still eaten today? Native to the Americas, prickly pears are the fruit of the Nepalis cactus, whose tall cacti have beaver tail-like paddles that dot the western landscape. Prickly pears are a bright neon pink, with a sweet, delicious taste that's a cross between bubblegum and watermelon. The juice is often used in jams or candies, but is showing up today in craft cocktails and even in vinaigrettes. Popular in many areas of the world, particularly Latin America, they're high in fiber, antioxidants, and carotenoids. Prickly pears are said to be good for you, and are promoted for treating diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity, and even hangovers. One thing is certain, though. As LaSalle's explorers learned, the prickly part can kill you. So if you come across a prickly pear, make sure to handle it with leather gloves and remove all the tiny little spines before you even think about eating it. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats. On February 29, 1918, a French wine salesman named Arnaud Kazanov opened Arnaud's restaurant in New Orleans, French Quarter. The extravagant, eccentric Count, as he dubbed himself, spent decades expanding the restaurant in size and scope, creating an institution specializing in French Creole cuisine. One hundred years later, the legendary restaurant remains an institution with endless stories to tell. The Louisiana Eats team recently visited Arno's to speak with the family, ushering the restaurant into its second century. My name is Katie Kasparian. I'm Jane Kasparian. And I'm Archie Kasparian. The Kasparians are the second family to run Arno's, which they took over in 1978. Until then, Count Arno Kazanov's theatrical daughter, Germaine Wells, operated the restaurant as her stage. To Germaine, the restaurant business was, to quote her, a play in two acts, lunch and dinner. For decades, Germaine resisted offers to hand over the keys to her father's treasured restaurant. That all changed when she met the late Archie Kasparian Sr. and his wife Jane in the late 70s. I asked Jane to take us back to those days. Well, Archie was in the hotel business, and uh, he ran the Royal Orleans and then the Royal Sinesta. And he loved food and beverage. That's what he was wonderful at. And he always said he wanted to be a restaurateur. He'd been offered the Royal Sinesta, the corporate office was in um, Boston, and he didn't want to go back there. He loved New Orleans. He did not want to leave New Orleans. All of a sudden, Arno's was up for grabs. And he worked very hard to get it because everybody in town wanted it. But for some reason, Jermaine Wells took a liking to him. Germaine saw a little bit of her father in Archie. He shared the Count's European flair with his love for good cigars, 
handsome clothes, and fine dining. Archie and Germaine spent many lunches together talking business at the Royal Sinesta, where Archie was the general manager. She called him Sonny. She couldn't, re- I guess, couldn't remember his name, but anyway. And her lawyer, George Camber, was with her. And it was just, Archie could drink, but my goodness, he would tell all the waiters, put water in mine or something, and then she got suspicious. <laughs> and she grabbed his drink one day and saw it was water, and that was it. He had to go back to vodka. She was having, I guess, heart failure, and so she had vodka and cranberry juice because she thought the cranberry juice would help her heart, but it didn't stop her drinking. She could really drink. <laughs> Seems logical. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like her stuff. So anyway, it was months and months and months and months, and finally she said his initials were the same as her father, Arno Kazanath. He smoked cigars, and he liked to tell stories, and he liked brandy. Everything was just like her dad. So that's how we got in this deal. And, and of course, did it on a wing and a prayer because we had no money. And by 1978, Arno's was in desperate need of a makeover. Since Count Arno's death three decades earlier, the quality of the dining experience was on the decline. Even the buildings that housed the restaurant were in great disrepair. The place needed fixing from head foot. She had never touched the place. You know, as she got older, she would close off a room. Mm-hmm. If that it, was the solution the to solution fixing. The solution is the roof, if it's leaking, just close the room. Or if there are pigeons flying around, just close the room and, you know, forget about it. So um, it was quite an undertaking. Despite a lack of funds and their parents' reservations, both Archie and Jane were confident that they could turn the place around. They thought we were crazy when they first came in here. But we could see what a wonderful old place it was and how marvelous it could be. We did the downstairs in the kitchen, and we were able to open March 1st of 79, which was really unbelievable. And then after she died, we were able to purchase the restaurant. With the death of Germaine Wells in 1983, one chapter of Arno's history ended, and a new one began, with the Casparians leading the charge. Arno's current success can be attributed to the Casparian's ability to present fresh ideas while maintaining a link to the past. Even the menu maintains a common thread with the Count. But when Archie and Jane took over the menu, there were some items on there that they had no problems getting rid of, including potatoes cooked in more ways than I can easily name. Well, that and the Hawaiian ham and pineapple, and there was spaghetti and meatballs, you could have two or one, things that made no sense in a French restaurant. A few of the items we had recipes for, but the recipes made no sense whatsoever. So that took a lot of doing. We had to research if they were classic dishes, what should they have tasted like. We used to have to buy the ramelade sauce from Germaine, and she had a guy who worked for her. So the original Al Copeland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because he wouldn't give up the recipe. Right. <laughs> I mean, we were kind of upset because he made it in this big old nasty wooden vat, you know, and it didn't look like they ever washed it, and we were forced to buy it. Anyway, when she died, we got the recipe. Well, of course, it didn't taste the way it should. The other thing was the Meniere sauce. And at that time, Warren LaRuth was doing um, consulting work because he was a food chemist, and he worked with us and we perfected the ramelade sauce and the meniere sauce. He remembered them, you know, because he lived here all his life. But we worked and worked and worked and went through a lot of recipes until we got it right. Because it had to be, the sauce had to be just the right amount of spice so you get the hit on the third shrimp, (laughs) the third bite. And um, any new recipe, we type up, keep refining it, and then once it's okay, it goes in a book, it's stamped, and so the cooks all know you have to use this recipe. When they redid it, my mother and father redid the kitchen. They brought in you know, a national uh, kitchen design firm to come down here that was a contact from the, from the hotel days. Archie, coming from the hotel business, 
was sick and tired of going to hotels where the kitchen was the last thought mm. when they were building these hotels. And so there it wasn't big enough to handle the volume. He ran this like a hotel. And he was the first restaurateur to have department heads. We had the housekeeping and the storekeeper and the banquet and the chef and the sales department. No restaurant in town had a sales department. Now they all do. So I think he really um, was pretty special in that, in that respect, that he really brought a lot to the restaurant business. He was just an incredible visionary. He yeah. really was. Yeah. And I know you all miss him tremendously. Oh, How long has he been gone? Nine, Nine years. years. Oh, my goodness. He was so brilliant, um, so talented. I mean, you would love him. Could tell a good story. You know, he's a party boy, but really smart and, um, and hardworking, very hardworking. What do you see as his legacy here? Well, just this whole place. I mean, you know, wasn't me. I, and, then, and then there'd be these two. And these, yeah, yeah, yeah. He trained these wonderful children, you know, um, and attention to detail. You know, he really, would, like as I said, would drive you crazy, but he, it had to be done a certain way, and he was right. Have you, know? you all ever gotten to a point in the last nine years when you're trying to make a decision? Do you say, well, what, what would Archie do? I'd say every day, probably, yeah. I think we live just wanting to make him proud of what we do. And, you know. Both we, of them. Yeah, absolutely. My mother and my father. But, you know, there are big shoes to fill for both of them. And I'm not sure that we're worthy to fill them just yet. But, you are. But we certainly, you know, every decision that we make is we, we take that into account of what would he do? Would he, would he be proud of this? And, you know. What I'm most proud of about what he, what they both have done is just that I'm not sure that Arno's, but for them, would be what it is right now, whether it would look this way, whether people would continue to come to Arno's, whether another operator would have tried to keep the continuity through the decades and yet still build on the quality, whether it would be completely different, you know. But you know, it was. A one, it's a wonderful, grand old place, and we wanted it to be like it, if it wasn't, like it should have been in 1918, and um, really it is a very special place, and I've been very lucky to have been a part of it. That was Jane, Katie, and Archie Kasparian proprietors of Arno's Restaurant. Help celebrate its 100th birthday by making a reservation today. That's it for this week's edition of Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Have you missed an episode of Louisiana Eats? Hear today's show or catch up on previous editions anytime online at itsneworleans.com. If you're not podcasting yet, it's time to subscribe. We've launched an exclusive podcast series, Louisiana Eats Quick Bites, made up of sneak previews of material that hasn't hit the airwaves yet and full-length interviews never heard on the show before. Visit our podcast page at poppytooker.com so you won't miss a single serving of our broadcast or our podcast. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarain's, French Market Coffee, Camellia Beans, and Rouse's Markets. Additional support for Louisiana Eats is provided by the shreveport Bossier Convention and Tourist Bureau and from Tableau. Brunch and dinner daily with outdoor balcony dining overlooking Jackson Square. Original theme music by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Big thanks to producers Joe Schreiner, Sarah Holtz, and Reggie Morris. And to our business manager and social media maven, Maddie Mulladew. Come visit us anytime in our Louisiana Eat studios at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. Don't forget to find our recipes and see what we're up to at poppytooker.com. You can check us out on Instagram and Facebook, too. 
Louisiana Eats is a production of Poppy Tooker Broadcasting. <laughs>